Good morning. The fate of peoples is made like this. Two men in small rooms. Forget the coronations, the conclaves of cardinals, the pomp and processions. This is how the world changes. A counter pushed across a table, a pen stroke that alters the force of a phrase, a woman's sigh as she passes and leaves on the air a trail of orange flower or rose water. Now this quote comes from the book Wolf Hall by the wonderful author Hilary Mantel, who died only a few months ago. I like it because it points to the truth of coronations. Mantel was writing about the Tudor period, but the point she made about the 16th century holds true today. Tomorrow's coronation of King Charles III doesn't make the fate of peoples. It is, at most, a ceremony. It won't make the trains run on time or the wave of strikes stop. Kings have always had limits on their power. Something that the Danish King of England, Canut, tried to demonstrate in the 11th century. Canut placed his throne on the beach and told the incoming tide to turn back. It, quite obviously, didn't. And Canut was able to prove that he, ruler of three kingdoms, couldn't do everything. Canut, though, ruled his kingdom as well as reigned over it. And our new king, Charles, will be a reigning monarch, but he doesn't rule. And there's a significant difference between those two things. Nearly 1,050 years ago, the coronation took place, which set the template for all subsequent royal coronations in England and then the United Kingdom. It was of a king who very few people today have ever heard of, King Edgar. He'd been reigning as king for 14 years when he was finally crowned King of England in 973, and his coronation took place about a mile away from where I am today, down in Bath. It was a service that was designed by the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Dunstan, and there are many elements of the service that Dunstan designed that remain today. My favourite of which is the recognition. Now this is the first element of the English coronation rite, and for very good reason. The king is presented to the four corners of Westminster Abbey, and this represents him being shown to the north, the south, the east and the west of the United Kingdom. The purpose of this in 2023 is to allow those four corners of the UK, and today the four countries of the UK, to acknowledge Charles as their undoubted king and to do him homage and service. Today, this helps to affirm the united within the United Kingdom. It's important, but it's not life and limb stuff, and certainly not life and limb for Charles himself. However, in the medieval world, this recognition was vital. Kingship was not necessarily entirely hereditary. Son did not always follow father, and we are talking about sons and fathers in the medieval world. There was, at that point, an element of election within the position. When the monarch was recognised by his nobles, it was a sign that they weren't going to rebel and put his brother, his uncle or his son on the throne. And we retain that element today. It isn't, though, quite as important. None of Charles's uncles are alive to seize the throne. And I'm not sure that the country is quite ready for his brother Andrew to take it from him. There's always his second son, Harry, who'd possibly quite like to overthrow Daddy and institute a super-woke monarchy fit for the 21st century. But again, that seems unlikely. Still though, Charles will be recognised by the country in a sort of election as our undoubted king. If you look on Twitter on the afternoon of the coronation, I'll lay good money that the hashtag NotMyKing will be trending. However, I'll also bet that no one who's actually in Westminster Abbey is going to shout that out at the moment of recognition. Nope, that'll be one for the so-called tofu-eating wokarati on their socials. There were different problems back in 1066, though. In one of the two coronations that year, the first of Harold Godwinson and the second of William the Conqueror, the moment of recognition got a little spicy. One Norman historian wrote that when the Archbishop asked the people whether it was their will that William should be crowned as their Lord, all shouted their joyous assent. In fact, 
They shouted so loudly that the Norman soldiers outside the abbey were worried that inside William was being attacked by the very recently conquered Anglo-Saxons. So they started burning the houses around the building. See, coronations could be properly dangerous in medieval times. The music that you heard before today's assembly is a coronation anthem, Zadok the Priest by Handel. Whilst it's a very famous piece of music in its own right, today it's probably more famous to most people in the chapel as the music for the Champions League. It plays at the beginning of each match and all the ad breaks, usually with pictures of modern royalty like Messi or Mbappe on the screen. The music was composed for the coronation of George II in 1727, and it uses a biblical text about the anointing of King Solomon by Zadok, the high priest of Israel. This is significant. The coronation of a British monarch draws upon biblical coronations for good reason. It emphasises that the coronation of a British monarch is sacred and inextricably linked with Judeo-Christian religious traditions. There are elements of a coronation that resemble other established religious sacraments. The king is reborn from heir to divinely ordained monarch. And this resembles the Christian sacrament of baptism. The king swears a coronation oath to behave in a proper way. This resembles the sacrament of marriage between the king and his people. The king is ordained as a monarch in a similar way to how priests are ordained into holy orders. This sacred nature of monarchy is not surprising. The British monarch holds the titles of Supreme Governor of the Church of England and Defender of Faith. This second title was first bestowed on Henry VIII of Six Wives fame in 1521 by the Catholic Pope. When the Church in England became the Church of England in the 1530s, the title became focused on defending the Anglican, not the Catholic faith. Indeed, part of tomorrow's coronation oath has Charles declaring that he is a faithful Protestant. However, King Charles III wants to, wants to focus on defending all Britain's religions. And in tomorrow's ceremony, there are roles for the Greek Orthodox Archbishop of Great Britain, the moderator of the Free Churches and the Catholic Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster. Greetings will also be given by representatives from the Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, Jewish and Buddhist communities. In an interesting touch, we won't be able to hear the chief rabbi's greeting on television. The coronation takes place on a Saturday and so the chief rabbi will, will be observing Shabbat, which prohibits the use of electricity, including microphones. When the king is anointed, he sits in a special chair. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, it's called the coronation chair. It was made in about 1300 by King Edward I, the hammer of the Scots. So it's over 700 years old. This chair sits in Westminster Abbey all the time and has done for most of those 700 years. And we're very fortunate here at Prior Park that we don't have much of a tradition of students graffitiing their names about the place, though there are a very few places in the chapel where they did so. Next door to Westminster Abbey, though, is Westminster School. And in the 18th and 19th century, the schoolboys there liked to graffiti. And the back of the 700-year-old chair that Charles III will be anointed and crowned on has quite a few names on it. A tourist inscribed, P. Abbott slept in this chair, 5th to the 6th of July, 1800. And so he has become part of the coronation story. Will we still remember a Banksy in 200 years? Very possibly. However, we definitely remember him if he spray painted it to the back of the king's chair. When Zadok the priest is sung by the choir in the abbey tomorrow, it will mean the king is being anointed. And even the oil that they use to anoint him is special. It comes from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem and has been perfumed with essential oils like jasmine, neroli and cinnamon. The Archbishop of Canterbury uses a special spoon to pour the oil on the king's hands, his breast and his head. Now, we won't see this as there will be a canopy erected around him to hide it from public view. The king is given some privacy 
even when there are billions watching the service. And this is to signify that he believes that God is anointing him at that moment. And so it should be a private moment between God and monarch. At this point, he wears simple white clothing and takes off all of the gaudy robes. Now think about why this happens. It's to symbolize his humility before his God, just as the robes signify his power before his subjects when he puts them on. The word coronation, though, literally means placing a crown on a person's head. And tomorrow, that'll be the big hurrah and huzzah moment towards the end of the service. A crown is a relatively recent addition to kingship. In the ancient world, rulers didn't wear a crown, but instead wore a diadem, which was basically a headband, kind of like tennis players wear today. Rafa Nadal's look of the white headband is very similar to that which would have been worn by the Persian emperors and kings of kings. Rafa, though, is known as the king of clay. Cyrus and Xerxes were the king of kings, and their diadems showed this to everyone. The crown that Charles will be crowned with tomorrow is known as St. Edward's crown. It's named for the patron saint of the British royal family, St. Edward the Confessor. Brilliantly, though, it's not his crown. Edward was made a saint about a hundred years after his death, and so objects associated with his reign became holy relics, worth a few pounds to whichever church had them. At that point, the monks of Westminster Abbey said that actually Edward had asked them to look after his crown when he died a hundred years before, and therefore they had the relic. Nothing at all suspicious there. Anyway, that crown was used for nearly 500 years before it was sold off during the Civil War as a sign, Oliver Cromwell said, of the detestable rule of kings. Only a few years later, the monarchy was back and they got given a new crown. New crown, old name. Within a decade, though, that crown had been flattened with a mallet and chucked in a swag bag, which happened as part of an audacious robbery attempt by the splendidly named Captain Blood. It was recovered though. It weighs a little over two kilos, so not very good for the neck. The 444 jewels in it are clearly real and quite heavy. As I said at the beginning of this assembly, coronations in the 21st century aren't going to change the world. However, they point to the history of how monarchy has developed and evolved over the past few millennia. We don't think today of our monarch ruling over us. Indeed, God save the king, which we will sing tomorrow, states that we hope he'll reign over us for a long time. The elective element to kingship is still there though, but it's much less pronounced than it would have been centuries ago. Kings and queens have always served. However, bad rulers have been there to serve themselves. Monarchs in the current day and age are, it is very much to be hoped, there to serve all of us, whatever our faith, background and attitudes towards the very institution of monarchy. Let's hope that Charles serves a country of wealth, peace and godliness, as will be prayed for tomorrow. So we'll finish now with a variation of a prayer that the Archbishop of Canterbury will say for our new king tomorrow. Let us pray. Lord, enthroned in heavenly splendour, look with favour upon your servant, Charles, our king and bestow upon him such gifts of wisdom and love that we and all your people may live in peace and prosperity and in loving service one to another to your eternal glory who with the father and the holy spirit reigns supreme over all things one god now and forever amen i hope you all enjoy a wonderful coronation weekend. Goodbye.